Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Michelle Logan. I'm the director of National Shelter Embed Programming for Best Friends Animal Society. I want to thank everybody for taking the opportunity to join us this evening. Um, before we get rolling, there's just a few of those housekeeping items I just need to go over. Um, just so everybody's aware that you are automatically muted for the presentation portion of the webinar. So you don't have to worry about accidentally unmuting yourself, which is great because I do that all the time. Um, if anyone has questions at any point, you can type those into the Q&A box. Um, questions submitted through the Q&A box um, will only be visible on our end. Um, we may pause a few times throughout the presentation to answer questions from the Q&A if they're relevant at the moment, um, or else we do have some scheduled time at the end of the presentation to go over those. Um, keep an eye on the chat box. Our team will be putting some links in there of resources. Um, so they'll post those there as we talk about things. And also please note this webinar is being recorded and it will be available after this session um, on our website. That's network.bestfriends.org. So I do want to introduce our panelists tonight and thank them for joining us. Um, first off, we have Don Reiser and Osby Montes from Hesperia Animal Services. Um, Don's the Animal Services Manager, and Osby's the Senior Animal Control Officer. Don and Osby, can you guys uh, turn your camera on? Here we go, they're coming up. And then we also have Audra Mullins. She's an Animal Control Officer at Santa Rosa County Animal Services in Florida. And then we have Leah Massey, who is the Community Cat Program Manager at the Humane Society of Charlotte in North Carolina. And also Bennett Simonson, the Community Program Manager at Pima Animal Care Center in Tucson, Arizona. So thank you guys for joining us this evening and uh, being willing to talk to our attendees. I wanna start off with Don and Osby. Um, you know, Don, when you and I chatted uh, last week, you were talking a little bit about some of the hesitancies you had to implementing a community cat program. Can you share with us a little bit about um, what you were hesitant about and how you overcame that? Several years ago, I met with Jose O'Connell from Best Friends, and he told us about a free neuter and release program that other agencies were doing with a tremendous amount of success, but very little pushback uh, from the public. I was very hesitant along with my staff about starting an SNR program and how we we're going to get the buy in from our staff, the public, plus the additional veterinarian expenses. Well, Best Friends offered us a grant to help offset the increased veterinarian expenses. I wrote the policy, uh, we implemented the program, and it was just an amazing success. And some of the benefits uh, from this program is you know, we improved the feral cats' lives. Cats vaccinated for injuries, illnesses, and treated predator release, stabilized cat colonies, a reduction in calls and complaints from neighbors about the behaviors associated with mating, spaying, or spraying, fighting, roaming, breeding. Um, the resources we had previously spent on ineffective removal and lethal services are now spent on non-lethal life-saving uh, for our feral cats. And the big one is just positive public reaction, increasing uh, fundraising platforms and partnerships, positive media exposure and support of our staff volunteers and, and the community at large. That's great. Sounds like a big success. It, it, incredible. And, and I gotta tell you, we were all surprised. And Jose kept telling us, he, he would tell me, trust me. Um, and then we were very blessed uh, Sheila with Best Friends, uh, we were able to use her regularly as we started up the program and we, and we tweaked the program a little and it, it, it certainly surprised all of us how successful we are. And Osby, I want to ask you a little bit as the Senior Animal Control Officer, how did you, you know, what were some of those critical factors for leading your team through this change? Um, I think one of the biggest factors was uh, education. Um, you know, we're so used to just doing, pretty much doing the same thing all the time. You know, you get used to this routine and, um, you know, you think it's working, and, but you know, the, res the numbers and the results were not showing that. But so uh, one of the biggest thing was we had to educate. We, we, we had best friends come out and they uh, had a little training uh, session for us. And they 
talked about, you know, all the positives of, you know, how it worked, how, you know, um, what we've been doing in the years past wasn't working. So let's try maybe spaying neutering these animals, putting them back out, you know, that would then, um, so, you know, help with the colonies to reduce the colonies. Um, and, you know, one of my, the biggest things that on my end was to trust the system and to just do it. You know, I trusted the system um, in, and my team saw that. My team saw that, hey, you know what? He's really excited to do this and he's putting all the effort into it to make this happen. And so they, they followed, they followed and saw uh, after, you know, after the being educated in the training um, and they saw which direction we were going. And uh, let, let me tell you, we were, my officers were quite surprised by the outcome. Um, you know, they thought for sure that we were going to get maybe complaints because we were out there, you know, just dropping off animals or, you know, uh, they were always so scared of maybe somebody just recording them and, and, and just putting it all over media. Hey, look at this officer. He's just out there dropping off animals. And you know what? Um, may, once we, a few times we were approached and, um, you know, we explained what we were doing and the, the community has really accepted it and is really, really grateful of what we're doing. Yeah, and I want to touch on something you just mentioned where you said where the community sees us out there dropping off animals, which is not the perception most people think of animal control, right? How did you overcome some of that either with the citizens and also with your own team? You know, I know often folks say, well, the return portion of trap, neuter, vaccinate and return is abandonment. It, it, and, and you're right. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people do see it as that, but you know, what, what we're doing is, you know, first of all, uh, the penal code section here, at least in California, is you have to be an owner and animal to, to pretty much abandon it. You have to be, you have to be the owner and obviously uh, take it somewhere, abandon it, and where you're no longer giving it resources, you're no longer putting it in, in pretty much in, in harm. And that's not what we're doing is we're identifying these areas where these animals are, you know, being fed. There is water sources, you know, that they are community cats. And what we're doing is we're just spaying, neutering these animals, vaccinating them, getting them treatment that they've never received before. Um, that you know they're now being spayed or neutered where they're not reproducing. You know these females are not attracting other males, and so it's helping break up the colony. And so a lot of that was just educating the public, like, hey, look, this is not abandonment. We're we're trying to to this to help these colonies and get them to to maybe just maybe disperse or just you know, reduce the number that are in the colony. And like, you know, I explained to many of our of residents for many years, these animals have been being trapped and euthanized. And it's the same people that are continuing to trap, you know, every year, every six months, and it doesn't fix the problem. And so um, explaining a lot of this to the public and to the community, um, and they, they like definitely have, um, have accepted it. They definitely have accepted it. And uh, I, I think it was probably the, the best program, you know, that we have imp have implemented it since I've been here 14 years. Uh, and just to see that these animals are, you know, getting the treatment and they're continuing to be out there in the community. Thank you for that, yeah. And Don, I want to close off with you again, when we chatted, um, you had mentioned there was kind of a, an unintentional um, positive outcome from this that, you know, we tend to focus on you know, serving the community and the life-saving component and that, you know, that aspect of implementing these programs. But you mentioned something else that I think is, is really important to share with folks what you've seen. Uh, absolutely. You know, one of the things I did see with our staff is just compassion fatigue. And our, our staff, uh, they look stressed, tired, lacking empathy, burned out, and with tears on their faces as they come out of the euthanasia room. Um, they would come to work knowing that they were going to have to maybe euthanize 10 animals in the morning and maybe 10 animals before they went home. And in the past, our staff euthanized 100% of all the feral cats that came into the facility. And our kennel staff, you, you know, they didn't want to get close to these animals in the shelter and they didn't want to have their heart broken because they were going to have to euthanize these animals maybe later in the week. So with our spay, neuter, and release program, as well as our managed intake program, the only animals our staff euthanizes are so severely injured or sick that our shelter veterinarian thinks it would be in the best interest for that animal to be euthanized. Uh, this gives our kennel staff significantly um, more time to work with the public and rescue groups. 
getting animals adopted and animals with some, some uh, you know, medical or behavioral issues uh, to rescue groups for treatment. Um, without doubt, these changes have completely turned around the, the moral of our shelter. And so when our staff come to work, they, they are happy knowing they're gonna make that positive difference to the animals in the care. So to date, uh, we have saved the lives of 1,734 feral cats and our shelter adoption rescue rate for our dogs is about 96% and the adoption SNR rate for our cats is about 93%. And, and I will tell you, we, we just pulled up some of the numbers um, from like 2017 and we have euthanized 2,256 animals. And I think that today we're less than 200 animals. And I, I, can, I can promise you next year, it's, it's gonna get better with the neonatal expansion programs. Uh, and, and so our staff is just incredibly proud to be a, a no-kill shelter now. Congratulations to you guys. That's been astronomical success. And somewhere I heard that Osby makes some great barbecue. So I'm kind of thinking maybe you guys need a little celebration for the team over there. <laughs> well, you're gonna have to come visit yeah, us for yeah, sure. Yes, yes, he is. He is the Absolutely. Our facility party, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you guys so much for sharing. I'm going to switch over to Audra now from Santa Rosa County in Florida. Um, and let's see if Audra, you can turn that thank camera you, on. Here you come. Thank you. So Audra, I know you guys like to, you know, you're in the panhandle there, which, uh, you know, sometimes is more referred to as Southern Alabama rather than Florida. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> But I want to ask you, I mean, Audrey, you've been an, an officer for years and, you know, you have some great relationships with the members of your community and, you know, the community cap program for you guys is a newer program and just officer, <laughs> there's one of them right now, <laughs> you know, to, to speak to, you know, the, your fellow officers on the call and others, how does it feel to provide that different kind of service to your community? Um, it took some getting used to we had um, there's a lot of reservations and there's still some officers that have you know they haven't been actively participating yet we've, we're kind of short staffed right now but I think that overall it's been successful what we've done we, it's really new for us in the last couple of months we really have been able to start the program so we're already seeing some differences um, we're definitely not seeing as many sick kittens coming in yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, I did want to touch too, because you had mentioned to me um, one of the times that I was down there and recently we touched base this week too, that you struggled, you know, professionally and personally with what was the return portion and the potential abandonment, you know, as it could be viewed. So I really was hoping you'd share some of that with everybody. Well, we as the animal control officers, and I've been doing this for about 15 years, we know our job is to protect animals from people and people from animals. So it was hard for me um, because I have seen injured cats and, and, and I mean, the list goes on and on. People complaining, you know, you want to do your job and to help out with, you know, the need for the population to be controlled. But the more research you do with this program, uh, we're seeing a lot of differences. There's not as many complaints now. Um, and it was, it was really, really hard because we've always done the same thing, but it's kind of like that comment Scott made to me, they're always going to be there. They're always going to be there. So, you know, and that's what even this week, just talking to people, explaining to them that it's, you're not, we're not helping the situation. I mean, because, you know, cats will travel home. We know this, we know they can travel 30 miles if need be. So it is, it's, it's. And it's making people, education is very important. So making people understand. And I think once you start the program, like officers that are, have res reservations about it, I think it'll make a difference once they see the outcome. Is I think that's the, the biggest thing for a lot of us. We want to see it, we want to make a difference. And now we're actually seeing a difference with this program. Yeah, and Audra, touch a little bit on that because you also had some things you were saying that were different in terms of, um, your team is actually now doing some proactive TNR along with the return to field. And, and you mentioned about some of the, the call volumes and the complaint calls in areas where you've been able to focus. 
Yeah, people are, they're accepting it. I mean, we still have a few complaints, but they're, they know that we're not, we're not going to actively be removing the cats from the area. And there were some angry people to begin with. So, you know, some of the officers having to deal with, um, accept this program that have been here for long term, the newer officers there, they kind of came in with us doing this program. So it was easier for them. Um, but there's a couple of us who've been here for years and it's like, you know, this is not, it's not fair for the cats. It's not fair for the community, but once you start it, they do see, I mean, if it's truly a feral cat, it's not going to be hanging around. It's going to be, you know, it's, it, it's usually only comes out at night. They're night hunters. Most of them, um, the, the little kitty that I have here, she was pretty feral. It took me a little bit to tame her and now she's, you know, all over you, you met her. She's little. She's a little, she, yeah, she was smacking me this morning, like, hey, you haven't fed me yet. But, <laughs> you know, there, there are caregivers out there that people don't really know about. And, and that's the thing. So the abandonment issue for me was you realize, you know, you, when you drive down the road as officers, you look, when you're looking for a dog, you look for an open garage or an open gate. Well, with cats is the open garage, the food bowls. So somebody's taking care of them. And I think it just helps them out because a lot of these people, can't afford to alter these animals or to get them vaccinated or they're afraid to they're afraid somebody will turn them in so that it makes a difference once you know you can communicate with them and and, and let them understand that you know you are there to help them and it does make a difference yeah now, Audra, now that you mentioned mamas again uh your cat there um she's like the perfect case study to me because you and i were talking the other day too about how um historically right there were a lot of cats that you know, showed up and hung around the shelter and things like that. But since she has been TNR and become the the resident community cat at the shelter there, um, I, I know you said she chases off the other cats and won't let them in there. <laughs> Nowhere. We have a whole colony around the corner, but nobody comes here, you know, because we were talking about when, at two o'clock in the morning, you drive and you would see eight cats fly out of a dumpster. They're you might see one once in a while, but so the vacuum effect really does help because she runs everything off. She's not having it. She you knows she lives in her horse trailer and she's like, this is mine. It, we're not, no, I'm not sharing. So yeah, she, she runs everything off. We don't have, we don't have a cat problem here anymore. <laughs> around the corner. Yeah, but it's nice to be able to share that with citizens as you're talking to them about your actual experience right there with her. Yeah, this was long before we even talked about the TNR program and she just kind of became a challenge because she stayed right here. So I fed her every day and then she, she got used to me. She doesn't trust everybody, but she's still, yeah, as you see, she was in my face. She's like, yeah, <laughs> that's why I came out here to hang out with her while we did this because I knew she'd probably show up. Yeah. So Audra, tell me, what would you want to say to other agencies or officers who ha still have some resistance to trying this type of program? You got to try it. I mean, to, 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 to reap the benefits or to see, to, you know, it's worth a shot. I mean, that's, that's the most important thing. I think if you, if you give it a try, you're never going to, you're not going to know until you try it. And that was it. So I was like, okay, let's, let's, let's just try this. I, I didn't want to, I was like, you know, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm really worried about leaving these cats out here for people to hurt them because I would rather humanely euthanize them, but that's not the case. I mean, the cats are being cared for. And I just think until you, you know, don't knock it till you try it. I think it's worth, it's worth the effort. I, I do. Thank you. Thank you, Audra. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and, and for all the work that you're doing down there. You guys are doing amazing things. I love the picture I got texted of you by a whole bunch of traps that you had just proactively. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, she shared that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna move on to Leah. Um, Leah, your program is a, a little bit different, um, you know, than Audra and, and Don and Osby. You actually work for the Humane Society, which is a nonprofit organization, um, as opposed to those two that are, are with a municipal agency. Um, but your program was designed in collaboration with Animal Care and Control um, as a bit of a workaround, I believe, right? Because you guys weren't able to really um, just out the gate start on a, a full community cat program. Can you give us some insight on that collaboration and kind yeah. of how it's evolved over the years? Yeah, so probably late 2017, I came on 
And because of the way the, the state laws are, um, the local municipal shelter wasn't comfortable with their officers running around catching cats and or returning them. So knowing that cats were the number one, you know, uh, euthanized animal at their shelter, we wanted to find a way around it. So best friends, you guys came in um, to help kind of talk them into working with us, uh, you know, the local nonprofit in the city. And my position was created so that I could basically create a trap, neuter, return program so that as a nonprofit, it's not officers doing it. It's, it's not uh, somebody that's being paid by the city to do it. So we're able to kind of work around the laws a little bit and the animal control was willing to work with us and we got the health department on board as well. Amazing. Amazing. I actually, uh, I'm going off my notes over here for a minute, but was very impressed. I did see on Facebook when they presented you with your golden trap for your yeah. 1000. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and you piloted, right? As you said, you couldn't just do it the way right through the municipality. You, you mm -hmm. kind of piloted this in different phases. And I'm going to quote yeah. you here because what you said to me the other day was you have to get your foot in the door and then just pry it open. You know, you said you try it, you say, let's do it. We pick one aspect, we go for it. Can you walk us through your journey a little bit about, you know, how you got your foot in the door, right? We started with that and then like kind of how, what your first step was. And then, I mean, you almost have that door fully yes. open. And so we started it. with just trap, neuter, return. Um, and with that, um, we basically made it so that locally we've got a, a phone a uh, system that makes it so that people that live in our county can call and say, street lights out, there's a pothole, there's a cat sleeping on my car, do something about it. So all those nuisance cat complaints, they started routing to me so that their officers would be able to focus on issues that are more important than a cat sleeping on somebody's car. Um, so we started talking to the people that were seeing these cats so that we could do TNR on those colonies and be able to hit the places where there were complaints, turn them into fixed cats, fixed colonies, and a lot of those complaints would go down. Uh, and then from that, we started saying, okay, we've still got some cats being surrendered or picked up at the municipal shelter. How can we help those cats? So maybe eight months into it, we created what we called our working cat program because we're a little more urban. We're, we are in the middle of the city. We're not in the middle of, uh, you know, uh, where there are a lot of farms in our area. So we called it a working cat instead of a barn cat program. And we started trying to find new outdoor homes for those cats. Um, about a year later, um, after much, hey, let's try this and being told, no, 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 we can't. We actually did start to do a little bit of return to field. Um, the workaround, it's small numbers, but the workaround is basically a feral or stray cat is surrendered to animal control. There's no owner, they're there through the wait period. And then if animal control decides, you know what, this cat can go back to its home, I'm the return vehicle. They just transfer the cat to our shelter or our possession, and I'm able to take the cat back to its home and release it there once it's been, of course, fixed, neutered, ear tipped, everything. Um, so we've been doing that for just short of a year now, I want to say. Um, and it's just been, it's kind of been a, you know, I bring something up, I get told, no, 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 we can't do that, whether it be from my organization or from our sister organization, the municipal shelter. And if I bring it up with other people, it slowly kind of drills into their heads and maybe they see other shelters talking about it. And sometimes it no longer seems to be my idea when it actually goes through which I don't really care at that point because it's getting done. So we've, we've been able to find more, way, more ways to try and help these the, the, their numbers from going up higher and getting them lower. And I know um, we actually started our partnership on a different aspect with um, the municipal back, I wanna say in 2014. And at the time, about 62% of their adult cats were euthanized. Um, as of this year where they've had a lot of other things change as well, um, I know they've got an overall live release rate, you know, certain animals uh, coming out is like 89%, that's cat and dogs, just under 90. And I want to say adult cats is at 72 and kittens is at 93 right now. Wow. And pretty much all of the adult cats that are coming into them right now, there might be a medical or a... Um, there's a reason if they're trapping them outside, there's a reason or it's an owner surrender issue. 
So they're not out actively trapping at this point with their officers. They, in fact, they're telling people that come to them with, I found this cat. If there's no microchip, no owner, they're turning it away and, to, and sending them to us for TNR. That's wonderful. Yeah, I'm glad you put that on the end. They're turning them away from intake and routing them through the clinic. <laughs> um, that's wonderful. I, I know you mentioned too that um, the virus was, you know, you said you, you bring up ideas and it may or may not be your idea and it doesn't matter by the time it gets done. Sometimes you have to keep bringing it up. But, um, you know, for, for all the, the negative things that have happened this past year, thanks to COVID and, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned that there was actually a silver lining. The virus actually allowed you to yeah. Um, implement another stage of your yeah. program. Yeah. One of the programs I've been trying to get through for probably one to two years, um, just because I've seen it work elsewhere, was a kitten program where people finding kittens outside, trying to keep these kittens from being surrendered at the local shelter. Um, so what we did is since in our state, all of the clinics across the state were shut down for about two months, right when kitten season was starting. Bad situation there. So we basically all looked at each other and said, we're gonna see more kittens this year. Let's just say it up front. Um, so what can we do to help with that and keep the surrender numbers down? So what we came up with, we're just, for now it's a pilot program, we're calling it a kitten program. Um, and if people were willing to uh, play socialize the kittens that they found and do some of the legwork to find them a new home, the cost of the initial vaccines and the spay neuter was gonna be covered um, for these kittens. And I know that uh, we, we started the program, we were doing it in, in a couple different appointments, but I believe we were hoping to be able to do 400 by the end of the year. Not gonna be quite that high just because capacity issues. But I know we started with vaccinations at the end of July, we've done 137 so far, kittens. Um, and then as of, sorry, that was, sorry, vaccines was 180. Okay. Uh, surgeries, we've done 137. These are kittens that weren't ear tipped. They were going into homes after having lived outside. And we're also directing those people to our trap me to return program so that mom and dad can get fixed. Cause hey, we know how fun it was socializing these kittens. I'm sure you never want to do it again. So that we're able to get the parents trap me to return, put back outside and they never have to worry about kittens in their backyard again. And it's been pretty popular. People have been excited that this is an option that it is available. And then as a fallback for all that, once the kittens have been fixed, spayed, neutered, they're vaccinated, um, we, we have had a few people that have said, you know, I have done everything I can. I've tried to find homes I can't. They're already vaccinated, they're already fixed. So it actually is an option to easily bring it into our shelter where we usually can't take strays at our shelter, but these have a medical history. They have a spay, neuter already done. So it's literally, we can take them into our shelter and immediately put them up for adoption. And yeah, that's it's been, for the, we haven't had very many people actually take advantage of that. So it's been a good program on our end for that. Just a lot of people excited about it and taking advantage of it. Yeah, and I did see too, um, I'm not gonna remember her last name, but Officer Julia that did the, um, they did some cute videos on their website to yes. talk to folks about what to do if you find kittens find, the first if, step if you find being kittens, don't kidnap them yes yeah don't kidnap them they don't did they did a really cute series with those little stuffed kittens and <laughs> so I, i'm again i'm not one to stick to our script and what i'm supposed to be asking so i'm going to go out again on a limb here but i mean leah you're one person right mm -hmm. like and like i said you had your trap your gold trap for your thousand trap yourself but like you cannot do all of this alone. No, no. Uh, so with our program, if it's a large colony um, or say it's a caretaker that because of maybe the monetary issues or their job um, or maybe even their age, mobility, they can't trap, I'll go out and help with trapping. Because I'm one person, I limit it to just the county that our local municipal uh, services work with. Um, but anyone can borrow traps from us to be able to trap the cats in their backyard and bring them in for trap due to return. Um, and we've basically said, look, we know these aren't your cats, you don't own them. So we're making it free to people that live within our county. If you're outside our county, it's a whole 20 bucks. Um, and we've been able to get grants to help cover that. Um, we've had a, a donor that's helped us out with having, helping to cover that because generally if you're able to do that, people are more likely to actually step up and say, you know what, it's not my cat, but I can do this a couple times, especially if I never have to do it ever again, or I never have to see kittens outside again, or this cat will calm down once I've gotten it. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, it's about the conversation, right? And that's what I feel like you're you're really good at having those conversation and even turning those folks that don't want the cat around, but at least if they play their part in this aspect of it, it will help with the solution. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Thank you for all you're doing. Very much appreciated and sharing your expertise with everybody here that they can emulate that. Um, I'm gonna move on to Bennett from Pima Animal Care Center. Um, and you know, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, Bennett, if you could turn your camera on, I can't see you yet. I feel like I'm talking to myself. Did it should be on. on. There you are. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so Bennett, you don't actually run a community cat program, right? You run a community program. But your program really intersects with um, community cats and the, the programs that Pima Animal, Animal Care Center does. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that correlation between those programs? So there are two programs in particular that I think connect really closely with the community cat program. One is our pet support center, which is the call center that anybody who wants to bring a pet into the shelter has to have an appointment and they have to be triaged through the pet support center before they can make that appointment. Um, we do not take in healthy stray cats because of our community cat program here. And with pet support, that's intimidating because people don't like being told no on the phone. So with this community cat program, it really helps the pet support center because they can say, we're not taking this animal in because it's healthier for them to stay in the community. They are not gonna do well in the shelter, but these are the other solutions we have for you. If your cat keeps getting in your yard and going to the bathroom in your garden, here's some options. And we can provide them with those alternatives to divert that intake, keep the animal, keep the cat where it is with somebody who's taking care of it. But it doesn't bother the rest of the community anymore. The other really great impact that this program has is for our access to care programs where we're going out and trying to engage different parts of the community that don't have resources. Um, the community cats are a great way to get into the neighborhoods and build up trust. People see you taking the cats, getting them vaccinated and bringing them back and that's going to go a long way for communities that have not had positive engagement with the shelters or if they're afraid that you are going to be judgmental of them and the way they keep their pets. So it's a good first step. It's a good way to get a feel of the neighborhood and see what other needs are there. Um, and it's important to just have the same approach to community cats as you do any other type of outreach. We are meeting people where they are and we're seeing their relationship with their pet as it is and accepting that. And that is, all of it ties in together perfectly. Yeah, it definitely. And it's about that acceptance, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's, you just hit that. I can say hit the nail on the head. Yeah, I can. <laughs> Sometimes I use those analogies we're not supposed to use, but. <laughs> um, and, you know, as you're, I mean, you basically are building that relationship with community members, as you mentioned that typically may not have been aware or had access to certain services and um, you get to, to see their reaction, you know, that component of building that trust, right? Where you're telling them, I'm gonna take the cat, but I promise you, I'm gonna bring it back and it's gonna be spayed and neutered and it's gonna be healthier. Like, do you have any, I'm sure you have hundreds of stories, but does anything stand out to you as like actually returning a cat and, and seeing not only that person's reaction to getting their cat back, but like, that light bulb moment of like, I can trust them. Yeah, the story that always stands out to me is one of the ones I had at the very beginning. I used to do door-to-door -door proactive outreach back in North Carolina. And one of my clients, a guy named Eugene, he was the cat guy in the neighborhood. He loved the cats. He knew all of them. He took care of them. And he had one in particular named Twinkles who hung out in his front yard. He was this adorable gray little tabby. And he was one of those, he was good with Eugene. He liked Eugene, but uh, he wasn't a fan of anybody else. So I met Eugene. I told him we could do this program and get Twinkles vaccinated, neutered for free. And he was so incredibly excited. He wouldn't have been able to transport Twinkles to the vet. He wouldn't have been able to afford it. And he didn't even know where to go to get vet care for Twinkles. So coming out, being able to trap Twinkles, get him vaccinated, get him neutered, Eugene told me that it made him so proud that he was able to provide that for his cat that he loved so much. Um, and Eugene just adored Twinkles. Um, it was so great to be able to provide that support to him. 
and help him get Twinkles where he felt he needed to be. And it made Eugene feel like a better pet owner. Like he, he loved Twinkles, but he felt guilty that he couldn't provide everything Twinkles needed. So coming in actually helped support their relationship and it helped Eugene feel even closer to Twinkles because he was giving him everything he needed. And it sounds like Twinkles wouldn't have made very many friends in the shelter if that was the other option, right? No. <laughs> so I guess that rolls into kind of my next question for you. You know, how does, uh, and I'm, I'm loosely using the term ownership, right? Mm -hmm. um, differ, you know, from with a community cat as a pet from the perceived traditional pet from a shelter. Yeah, so we as animal welfare have come up with this idea that a pet in a cat inside is the natural state of cats. But litter was only even made widely available in the 1950s. So over the last 70 years, we have drastically shifted this idea of what a cat ownership is supposed to look like. And for many, many communities, cats being outdoors or indoor outdoor cats is still the norm. So for us as animal welfare to go in and say, this is how you need to own your cat now, for many people in many different communities, that just seems completely abnormal. And it goes back to that idea of doing proactive outreach and building up relationships. We can't just go in and say, you are changing how you do this right now. We need to build a relationship with the community, explain why we think there are benefits to different types of pet ownership and give people the um, the space to make pet ownership like they works for them and works for their pet. Um, the biggest difference is just a less traditional idea of what ownership means, a less rigid idea. I may own this cat that I'm calling Sparky, but maybe Eugene down the street also owns him. Like there are multiple owners for cats often. Um, and they might be the, Twinkles down the street, right? <laughs> exactly. And the the biggest thing, the thing that's most important is that bond is often the same between a community cat and a cat that sleeps completely in your home. Um, you still get that connection, you still get that love, and you feel attachment to this animal that relies on you for survival. Um, and the next part of the Eugene story that I didn't tell, but I think illustrates this, is about a year after we got Twinkles altered and uh, vaccinated, he went missing. And this is the unfortunate reality of outdoor cats. We know this happens. And we don't know what happened to Twinkles. Um, I really hope he wasn't picked up by a rescuer who thought they were doing something good. Um, but I went and I checked on Eugene because Twinkles had been missing for about three weeks. And I asked him how he was feeling. And he says he was this 55-year-old um, black man who I like, had only met through this program. And we sit down on his porch and he starts crying and telling me that Twinkles provided him with love and support and that he felt like God had sent him Twinkles to help him survive the reality of being a black man in the South. And that's literally what he said to me. And he eventually had to excuse himself because he didn't want to cry in front of me. But his emotional connection to Twinkles was the same as it is I have to my cats who sleep on my bed. Um, and Luckily, since we built up that relationship and that since he knew we were there to support him, when he was ready for another cat, he came to the shelter and adopted it. And we provided him with information on how to keep the cat inside, what cat trees would do, what toys would help the cat stay inside. And so he actually transitioned to a different type of ownership with the next pet that he got. Wow. That's a, I mean, full circle, roundabout, heart-wrenching mm -hmm. story. Yeah. And it kind of kind of leads a little bit into my next question. Um, you know, seeing that relationship between Eugene and Twinkles, and um, and even though Twinkles wasn't friendly to everybody, mm -hmm. you know, I think sometimes in in rescue and animal welfare, we think, okay, well, the the feral cats or those that aren't friendly, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do to put them back. But the friendly ones, we should take in and put through our adoption program so they can have that indoor home. Um, mm -hmm. What would you tell somebody about, you know, why it's okay or should they allow friendly cats to go back out? Well, I think it's important to realize that just because that cat's outside doesn't mean there's not somebody like Eugene who's missing it and wants it back and loves it. 
Um, and it's hard to conceive if you've never had to have a cat out or a cat outdoors, it's hard to conceive why somebody would do that. But there's many, many reasons. Um, a lot of places have landlord restrictions and in areas with extreme poverty and areas with high numbers of people of color, there are fewer pet friendly rentals available. Like, they're just not available. And if you're struggling to meet rent already, you can't afford that extra to keep your cat inside. Um, landlords can be very strict about this type of thing. There can be allergies that keep, you can't keep the pet inside because your son's allergic and you can't expose your son to an allergen. Like that's something people can't really compromise on. Um, sometimes there are behavior concerns like the yowling or the scratching. And especially again, if you're renting, that can be the difference between you being able to stay in your house and having to be evicted. Um, there's also health concerns about unvaccinated animals. These TNR programs can play a huge part in animals actually being integrated into the home because now they've been fixed, they're healthy, and the person doesn't have to worry about exposing their family to something. But I think one of the biggest things that leads to people keeping cats outdoors is that's what they are used to. That's how their cats as a child were outdoors. They've always had cats outdoors and they think the cat wants to be outdoors. You bring them in and they try to bolt out the door or they try to go out the window. And a lot of people want to make their cat happy and they think that's the best way to keep them happy. And sometimes it is, right? Sometimes yeah. all the toys in the world and all the interaction and everything that cat needs some of that outdoor time. Yeah. So Bennett, how can shelters support people who have community cats as pets? I know you're, um, you're very lucky that you have, you know, that you manage a community mm -hmm. program, you know, and that the shelter is focused on that. But for other agencies that, that don't have a Bennett, <laughs> mm -hmm. how can they, you know, support their communities? I think one of the biggest things is just to acknowledge and accept that ownership may look a little different. Somebody may bring the cat and say, oh, I need it fixed, but the person down the street gets a say too. And maybe that person down the street doesn't want to get them fixed. I run into that where one owner wanted it done, the other didn't, and they decided not to get it done because they didn't want the owner that didn't want to get it done to feel bad about it. So it's important to realize that may be the case. Um, it's also important to realize the ways it's the same. Just because that cat is nice and on the street does not mean there's not somebody who loves it and wants it and will miss it when it's gone. So it's important to remember that a lot of these cats do have somebody attached to them. Uh, it's also important to provide information to these cat owners, tell them, you know, let the person guide the interaction. So like with Eugene, when he went to adopt another cat, he was open to the idea of keeping it inside. So we gave him instructions on how to keep a cat inside. If the person's not interested in transitioning the cat indoors, unless there's some medical reason that the cat will not thrive outside, you should probably accept that. Don't be prescriptive and decide that what you think is the correct way of owning that cat or caring for that cat is the only way. There are multiple ways to do it. Um, it's also really important to explain your policies and your approach to cats in the community. Don't just say it's best to keep the cats inside without explaining the risks or without explaining what goes into that. Um, and trust that the community cares about the cats as much as you do. If they've been thriving up until this point, somebody is caring for them. And we need to trust that the community wants to take care of these cats. You have those people who are like, get it off my property, I don't care. But for every one of those, there's probably 10 in the background that are looking at that cat and wanting it to thrive and be well. So trust your community to have your back and the cat. And we have ways to help those that don't want the cats on their particular property. Exactly. Absolutely. Thanks, Bennett. Sounds like you're doing you're some welcome. amazing work out there. Thank you. I'm going to pull up some questions here and see. Um, let's see. So we have um, a question from Stacy asking how to work with other animals other animal groups and or critics who are very vocal against returning friendlies. Um, and Bennett, you touched on that, uh, you just touched on that a bit. So I'm actually gonna um, ask Osby and Don, if you guys are still on, if you could touch a little bit on that about how you've dealt um, with some of the citizens that may have concerns with that. Can you hear us? Can yeah, you hear I can us hear you, Ozzy. Yep, Ozzy, sorry. Okay. So I think one of the things that we've done is uh, 
we, we created some brochures to kind of give uh, the public information. I think a lot of sometimes the, the issue is that they're not informed um, or maybe not educated or not, you know, not don't really understand the program. And I think a lot of times when you, the issues that we have had or, you know, the, some of the kickback that we have had about it, you know, we've either called them or we go out there, you know, face to face and we explain to them the process and explain to them all the negative of it and all the positives of it. And the positive always outweighs the negative. And I think, you know, the very few complaints that we have had and we've gone out and made, you know, contact with them and explained to them the process when we leave it's it's like they're a whole another person that, you know now they understand why we're doing what we're doing so i think a lot of it um is just reaching out to the community and actually explaining to them what is actually going on here uh, you know a lot of the time they think that you know these animals are just being thrown out and they're just abandoned and they're gone but sometimes they don't realize like hey this animal is already in this neighborhood maybe you didn't see it or you know look, look at this animal look how healthy it's been this animal wasn't just left here recently you know, this animal's been here in the, in the community and they might not know that, you know, that maybe the neighbor behind them is the one feeding them. Because there are sometimes certain ones that, you know, that we know there are certain uh, addresses that are the ones that are the ones putting the food and, that, and the water out there. And so we'll explain to them like, hey, you know what, just to let you know, somebody, you know, maybe behind you is taking care of them and, and you know, there is food and water in the sources. So we try to explain to them and, and, and the reasoning what we're doing. And it seems like we always get a positive uh, reaction and feedback from, from the community when we do that. Right. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. And that's really what it is, right? It sounds like you take the time to really serve your community and take the time to explain. And Yeah. yeah. And I think that's what makes the biggest difference to just to serve the community and, and, and take that extra time, the extra, you know, hour, that extra half an hour, 30 minutes to stop and just, you know, just, hey, this is what we're doing. Just want to tell you, hey, this is a program that we're running. You know, I know you kind of see me out here. You're kind of watching me. Let me explain to you what's going on, what we're doing and how this works and how it's going to help the community. So I think, you know, that's one of the biggest, um, you know, if, if, if you really want to reach out to the community and make sure that they're, you know, they, they're getting on board with you and their understanding is to reach out, reach out and explain to you, explain to them what, what's going on. Yeah. I'm going to ask Leah, actually, if you could jump in as well in terms of, um, you know, you working for the nonprofit supporting this and, you know, helping with the return of friendlies. Have you had any other organizations that, you um, are very vocal against any of the work that you're doing and how have you mitigated that? I haven't really been organizations. Um, okay. Typically what I tend to come across are either individuals and sometimes it'll be something like an HOA um, or um, managers at a building or a complex might be upset that I'm not going to remove these cats. These cats will be returned. Um, for us, the way we've been able to kind of get around that is even animal control officers will explain that there is no leash law, so there's nothing against these cats roaming outside. Um, so we, we use that as a way to say that we're not going to remove the cats. Let's try this. Let's do the spay neuter and give them a couple weeks to see if the, the noise complaints you're telling me about goes down. If let's try it, is what I hear you saying, right? There's again, that's Leah's whole... <laughs> let's, let's try this because I'm not going to, I'm not charging you anything. You're complaining right. that these cats are on your property, but I'm not charging you to come out there and do the service for you. One downside to that is because I'm doing it for them, they think I can do it immediately, which isn't always the case. Um, it's sometimes it, I have to schedule it out a little bit. And then we might have a day like today where there's a monsoon going on outside. Um, and I can't particularly catch outdoor cats when there's a monsoon happening outside. So <laughs> there are a lot of factors that go into it, but generally if you've explained everything to people or you stay in touch with them and explain what's going on that, you know what, I haven't forgotten about you. I am coming out there, we'll get this handled. It, it goes well. It's the, it's the communication is really the biggest thing. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, my next question here is from Emily. Um, and I'm actually going to ask Audra if you would answer this because you guys actually, um, your director and, and the team there did some work to get prepared for this. How did the decision get made to make the switch to the new way? Well, um, the cat population is growing. It didn't matter the euthanasia rate because we were trapping a lot of cats and euthanizing them and just there were still litters and litters and litters out there. So, I mean that was an important thing that we had to do something different. 
and we have a new we have a new director where we're they moved animal control under public safety and so he was on board and supportive of everything we want to do which is really important you've got to have somebody to back you up and we've wanted a vet here for years and we wanted to to change some things here because it's always been a pretty negative impact as far we i mean we you know they look at animal control officers you're just gonna take my animal and kill it that's just the standard answer for everything so i think working with some of the groups um it, it has made a difference and um, the you know you're talking about returning friendlies you know we had that discussion um i have a i have a about 20 cats now that need to be trapped and they're all about hey you know we want we want we'll take them all back except for one he's aggressive he's you know he's he's beating up the other cats and you know that's when you have to explain to them once you take that testosterone away he's not going to be so willing to be you know a bully i'd be so tough anymore <laughs> right exactly so yeah i mean that was one of the important things but i think having the the support of your management is one of the most important things you know so that was a it was a big leap a big challenge because things happen really quick here so i mean it went from like it was day and night within just like you know a couple of months everything changed so that was that was a huge that's a huge factor because we have now the support of our county commissioners we have the financial backing and that makes a huge difference as well because i mean i was i was listening to leah talk about the you know the this or maybe was, i'm sorry it was bennett the how the you, you have people that don't they don't want one fix you have all these different caregivers i kind of have a situation right now where this lady went to jail, her brother's there, he doesn't want to make a decision about her cats. We have about, there's got to be 30 cats, kittens, cats, they're, they're all over this property and they're, they're friendly. Well, from experience, you already know, I mean, I already know she's going to be evicted. Where is she going to take 30 cats? So I made the decision to go back out there and tell them, can you afford, because we do still have leash law for your cats that are pets not the community cats if their ears not tipped you're responsible for them so i made the decision i'm just gonna go out there and then write them a citation for not being vaccinated and roaming so and i mean it's harsh but sometimes you have to take that you know look i'm going to provide you a free service or you're going to get a citation for 30 cats yeah so it's not you know balanced you know weigh your options so yeah you're kind of giving them an option but not really right yeah i want to help you but so i mean i can help you or i could probably really hurt you more than I could help you as far as financially goes. You're talking about $150 a cat. So it, it's a quick mind changer. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Money talks, right? <laughs> so, and we, you know, they leave them outside anyway. She's going to abandon them. They're going to be abandoned cats at that point. So we might as well make them community cats because there are other people right there helping to feed these cats because she's not there she's in jail nobody's taking care of them so let's just feed them so we're gonna let's feed them outside so let's just go ahead and get them fixed and vaccinate them yeah and then working with the other neighbors who are already caring for them as if exactly them back, yes great yeah so it works thank you Welcome. Um, I don't have any final questions in here I don't know if um, our behind the scenes team has anything else they want me to any other questions that attendees had that they need answered? All right, well, I do want to thank everybody for attending today and a very special thank you to all of these amazing panelists who are doing so much amazing work, not only to help the animals in their community, but to better serve the people in their community as well. Thank you, everybody.